you know, eventually. Okay, now let's finish talking about myoglobin. All right. This is depict, trying to depict it in another way. It's not very good. This does point out something interesting, though. That iron can not only hold oxygen, it can also hold carbon monoxide. Oh, yeah. One of the reasons, there's two reasons carbon monoxide is poisonous. One of the reasons that it's poisonous is because it can displace oxygen in your myoglobin and also in your hemoglobin. Uh-oh. I need oxygen, right? We can imagine this is going to be a problem, and yes, it is a problem. Carbon monoxide is basically two molecules, a carbon and an oxygen. I mean, so two atoms, a carbon and an oxygen, just like oxygen is two atoms. And the molecular dimensions are very similar, so it's not surprising that it fits into that same place in the myoglobin structure. It fits into the same place in the hemoglobin structure as well. OK, so carbon monoxide is a problem. Let's take a look at this. Okay. This shows something that I've described, but I haven't given a name to. It's called denaturation. Remember I said we can take a protein and we boil it? We break all the hydrogen bonds. The, it unfolds. It comes apart because the hydrogen bonds aren't holding it together anymore. That phenomenon is called denaturation. Denaturation can happen as a result of heating. It can happen as a result of detergent. It can happen as a result of changes in pH. There's a variety of ways that a protein can unfold. And all of the different things that cause it to unfold are things that break those bonds that I showed you earlier, hydrogen bonds. They may change the charge so that you don't have the ionic interactions that you had before. Detergents will disrupt hydrophobic interactions. So any of these things can cause a protein to come apart, to denature, and when it's denatured, it has no function. It's not doing anything. The reason we wash our hands with soap is just that. We wash our hands with soap so that we denature the proteins that are in bacteria and kill the bacteria. The bacteria can't function. OK. Now, that's what I wanted to say there. We're not going to talk about refolding. That's a different phenomenon. What I want to do now is talk about the last structure of proteins that's going to be critical for us. We've had primary, secondary, tertiary. Now we're going to talk about quaternary. This one also is fairly easy to understand. Imagine, if you will, that I took four myoglobins and I made them sort of scrunch together into a bigger complex. Four individual myoglobins. Okay? If I did that, I would have something like hemoglobin. I would have something that had tertiary structure. It had not one subunit, but in this case it had four. So tertiary structure refers to interactions between different subunits of a bigger protein. So four myoglobins held together by some force would be a quaternary structure. So quaternary structure is when we have uh, the um, interactions between individual subunits of a bigger protein. Okay, Hemoglobin has quaternary structure. And the reason it has quaternary structure is it has four subunits. They're not globin. But they're very closely related to globin. What it has is two pair of two identical subunits. It has a structure that we describe as alpha 2, beta 2, meaning it has two units called alpha that are identical and two units called beta that are identical. And because it has more than one subunit, hemoglobin therefore has quaternary structure. Myoglobin only has one subunit. It does not have quaternary structure. So some proteins have quaternary structure, some don't. Some proteins had tertiary structure and some didn't. Right? The fibrous proteins didn't have tertiary structure. So anything that has multiple subunits has quaternary structure. And it's the multiple subunits of hemoglobin that gives it some phenomenal properties. And I want to talk about this. Let's look at hemoglobin first. OK. Hemoglobin has four subunits. It's a little hard to tell, but there are four different subunits here, two betas and two alphas. 
Each subunit has its own heme group. So there are one, two, three, four heme groups in this molecule. And each heme group has one iron atom held in exactly the way that we saw before. And each iron can hold on to one O2 molecule. So hemoglobin as a unit can hold a total of four oxygen atoms, four oxygen molecules, rather. Really. Now, hemoglobin is used not as an oxygen battery, but as an oxygen transport system. You might wonder why we have oxygen batteries and oxygen transport systems. What's the difference? Why don't we use myoglobin in our blood to carry oxygen? It certainly holds on to oxygen. The answer is because it holds on to oxygen too tightly. We would have no trouble with myoglobin, for example, going into our lungs and grabbing oxygen. The place where we would have trouble is if myoglobin went out to our tissues that needed oxygen. It doesn't want to give it up very much. That's why it's a good battery. It only gives up its oxygen when the concentration is really, really low. Okay. It's not real good at giving up oxygen. It's very good at grabbing it, but not so good at giving it up. Hemoglobin, on the other hand, is not only good at grabbing it, it's also good at giving it up. It does both really well. And that takes some very cool tricks in order for hemoglobin to do this. I'm going to describe the tricks. Okay? The tricks are rooted in that little movement of that iron by that fraction of an angstrom when oxygen binds. Okay? Let's think about a hemoglobin molecule. Okay? The properties I want this molecule to have is I want it to have a lot of attraction to oxygen when it's empty in the lungs. It goes to the lungs, it's got no oxygens. I want that guy to have a lot of attraction for oxygen in the lungs. And when it gets out of the lungs, where the oxygen concentration is high, and it goes out to the tissues where it's lower, I want it giving up that oxygen when the tissues need it, not when they're starving for oxygen. Okay? So I want it to sort of change how attractive it is for oxygen, depending upon the environment that it's in. In the tissues, give it up. In the lungs, grab it. Okay? How do I accomplish that? All right? Here's what happens. When I'm in the lungs, okay. Actually, let me show you. Let me show you something before that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here's a graph. Okay. I know you don't like graphs, but graphs tell a story. The story here is we're plotting on this graph the differences in affinity for oxygen. How strongly these molecule or these proteins want to grab onto oxygen. This is the percent saturation. So up here we've got 100% of the myoglobins or 100% of the proteins having an oxygen. Down here we have 0%. None of them have an oxygen. We plot that as a function of the oxygen concentration. Okay. Out here in the lungs, here is the affinity these guys have for oxygen. Hemoglobin's pretty good. 80% full of oxygen in the lungs. When we get in the tissues, which is more like about right here, we see that myoglobin only has affinity for maybe 15% of it is holding on to oxygen, whereas myoglobin still has 90% of it holding on to its oxygen. It doesn't want to give it up. This graph is showing you on a graph what I told you in words. Okay? It doesn't want to give it up. The myoglobin is hanging on to that oxygen come hell or high water. It's got to get really low in oxygen concentration before myoglobin starts giving up that oxygen. As it starts going down, it's giving up that oxygen. It takes pretty low oxygen concentration. My cells would starve if I did this to them all the time. As a last gasp for muscle cells, when they need that oxygen, myoglobin is there to give it up to them. Okay? But on a regular basis, I want something delivering oxygen, not waiting until the cell is starving to death for oxygen to do it. Hemoglobin is giving it up. Okay, look at how much it's given up compared to myoglobin at the at the concent at the oxygen concentration in the cells. Yes, uh, Tamara. Um, can myoglobin also remove CO2 from the cells? 
Uh, can my glomerulus remove CO2 from the cells? No, it cannot. And you don't want it to, because then we would hold it there because it's staying in the, in the muscles. So you don't want it to hold on to CO2, but it, it doesn't, no. Hemoglobin does, and we'll talk about that. Okay, now, so this graphically, it looks like what is actually happening, okay? Now I need to actually ask you to sort of envision this with me. I know that may be, that may be difficult in some cases, but I want to think about this. Let's think about our lungs. In my lungs, I've got blood going through, and that blood has hemoglobin in it. That hemoglobin has been going through my body, and it has gone and has dumped its load. It's dumped off its oxygen to the tissues that needed it. It comes back to the lungs to get more oxygen. So when it gets to the lungs, it's got zero oxygen in it, no oxygen. Are you with me? Now, in the lungs, I want hemoglobin to have great affinity for oxygen. Oh, sorry, wrong one. But I've gotten there and it's got no oxygen in it. Let's imagine that I've got an oxygen molecule that bumps into one of these heme groups. So it gets in there, it gets in that little slot, and all of a sudden, that oxygen finds that right place and that iron atom gets pulled up very slightly. Okay, So the iron atom has been pulled up very slightly and the iron atom was attached to a histidine that was attached to the rest of the protein, right? So if I pull the iron up, I pull the histidine up, right? And if I pull the histidine up, the histidine is attached to something else, so it gets pulled up. The foot bone is connected to the ankle bone, and the ankle bone is connected to the shin bone, and the shin bone is connected to the hip bone, and if I pull my toe, that force goes all the way through, right? What I have just done is I have very slightly changed the structure of that one unit of hemoglobin as a result of the binding of the oxygen. So picture now that I've got this one unit and it has a slightly different structure compared to the other three. You got that? It's got an oxygen, the other three don't have oxygen. Well, this one guy is interacting with the other three. So if I start changing this one, the interaction between the, that protein and the other proteins changes as well, right? Now we can start to see how this change in this one protein is now going to change an adjacent protein. It doesn't matter if it's alpha or beta, it doesn't matter. It starts the same with either one. But one of them's got oxygen. It has now changed its interaction with the next protein adjacent to it. And as a consequence, that protein has slightly opened up and become more available to bind another oxygen. What I've just described to you is a phenomenon called cooperativity. This is how hemoglobin changes its affinity for oxygen. Once one oxygen binds, it becomes much more likely the second one is going to bind. And once the second one binds, it becomes much more likely the third one is going to bind. And when the third one binds, it's much more likely the fourth one is going to bind. The affinity of this protein has changed as a result of being in this oxygen-rich environment. Binding of one caused this guy to want to gobble up oxygen with all the rest of them. That phenomenon is cooperativity. So cooperativity is a phenomenon where the binding of one molecule to a protein changes the binding affinity of the protein for others. The binding affinity of one molecule to a protein changes the affinity of that protein to bind others. So in oxygen, so in, in the lungs, we see oxygen coming onto hemoglobin. We see hemoglobin's affinity increasing, which is exactly what we want. Now that hemoglobin leaves my lungs, and it goes out into the tissues. Maybe it goes out here into my arm. Okay? It gets out here in my arm. Well, of course, my arm isn't breathing. My arm doesn't have oxygen in it, so the oxygen concentration is much lower. Everybody with me? This is not a covalent interaction. This is just an association. And so one of these oxygen pops off of the hemoglobin. One of the oxygen pops off of the hemoglobin, and it feeds this tissue in my arm. Well, guess what happens? Popping off of one favors the popping off of another one, favors the popping off of another one, and it goes the other way. Now, it's important to note, you saw that it only went down to about 15%. It didn't get rid of all the oxygen.